Well, it was truth till about 1.30 this morning and then I got up because I couldn't sleep and wrote a different one. So if I fall asleep during church, you'll forgive me, won't you? Let's just bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, what a great privilege it is for us to be here this morning, to open your word, to allow your spirit to speak to us. Lord, my prayer today is that somebody would hear something that would encourage them to place their confidence and trust in you, to know, Lord, that you love us so much that we can afford to love you back. May we not be adversely affected by the scandal of the cross, but brought to a point of full surrender is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's great to be back in Austinville. Many people have welcomed me today thinking that I'm a visitor, but I can assure you that I still very much feel at home. Paulette, thank you for those beautiful songs that you chose. Um, That was delightful. And I need to know, whose orchids are they? They're beautiful. Sophie? Sophie's left her orchids and run. She won't notice if I take them home, will she? They're gorgeous. Really, really delightful to see them. How many of you um, enjoyed watching the Olympics? Was it pretty exciting? Um, Anna Mears winning gold medal for the sprint in London four years ago. Um, This time, she perhaps wasn't so lucky. In fact, there was a few Australians, Kate, Bronte, a couple of them that were sure things, who failed to deliver. Um, Was the Olympics a success for Australia? I don't know. Did you know that we spend nearly 900000 for every Olympian that we send in sports programs in Australia? We might be a small country, but per capita, we invest an awful lot of money, nearly half a billion dollars in promoting sports amongst those who participate in them. And yet, even though the investment has been significant, we can see that from the high of the Sydney Olympics in the year 2000, there's been a steady decline in, um, in the medals that we have been able to buy. In fact, the chef de mission of the Australian Olympic team, Kitty Chiller, has been publicly shown on television crying, but it's not because of the loss of medals. I think it's more to do with the fact that some Australians decided to manipulate their own um, credentials to see if they could wangle their way into a sports event that perhaps they weren't entitled to be. And I think that as I read in the press and listen to the media, the word crisis has been coming up a little bit too often in respect to the Olympics. In fact, one of the writers in the Australian said that not since the Great Depression have the Games occurred at such a juncture of acute financial, political and social crises in Rio. And it's not just that Anami has got a bronze medal. What are they talking about? Is our world in a happy and safe place? Aren't you glad you live in Austinville where orchids grow prolifically and where all the children look like saints? We live, in a, we live in a space and a place that really we are just so privileged. I think all of the tourists that travel to afar when they come back to Austinville, they say there's something really lovely about where we live. Is that right, Anne? It's not too bad at all. Yeah, although wherever you go, you've got Rod with you, so every place looks the same, doesn't it? But are we kidding ourselves? Is Alstonville really nirvana? Is it really heaven? As a relatively lazy observer of the world, I find I can get a rough idea about what's going on by watching a few of my favourite current affairs shows on television. How many of you here like the program Q&A? Do you watch Q&A? Q&A is a very informative, easy way to kind of keep your your finger on the pulse and, and to sense the mood. And um, I think it was this week, it may have been last week, I don't know, because I won't stay up that late at night, I record it and watch it um, after the event. But the one that I watched most recently featured um, a a man who has become perhaps the voice of the modern scientific movement. Some of you grey-haired people would have been familiar with the genius in a wheelchair, Stephen Hawking. Well, Stephen Hawking has probably been replaced in our generation by a guy called Brian Cox. How many of you have heard of Professor Brian Cox is an astrophysicist. He's done many documentaries on, on, on the universe we live in. He's a gifted communicator. He's able to make um, profound and complex scientific 
concepts um, available and palatable to the common man. And Brian Cox was featured um, on this week's Q&A and, and most of the, the episode involved a, a little bit of banter between him and one of Pauline Hanson's senators who's a climate sceptic and they were having a little bit of banter um, about whether or not the world is in an environmental crisis. But I thought it was very interesting as I watched that that before they really dived into debate about um, the environment, the topic that was first raised in Q&A was the problem that Australia faces in dealing with its refugee crisis. Um, the, I'm not here to peddle any political views, but if you are aware of, of Australia's um, fight with refugees, we've, we've gone from a country that has opened its arms to a country that has shut its borders and essentially said we need to make a, a public spectacle of anybody who tries to come to this country by putting them in tents in some godforsaken tropical paradise um, and we need, we need to, to feed off the, um, the difficulty of these people to make sure that that nobody else will take the risky journey on the boat. And that's sort of where Australia's position is. And as there were some bleeding heart liberals there saying that this is an atrocity and that a civilised nation should show more compassion and others were saying that to show compassion would just mean more souls would die at sea. As this debate was raging, um, Tony Jones asked Brian Cox, Brian, what is your opinion on the refugee crisis in Australia. And I just want to show you a small clip and I want you to listen very carefully to how um, Brian segues from a local um, crisis that's happening in Australia to, to I guess, um, launch into what he sees is a coming political um, transition in understanding of how the world deals with its problems. So just listen as, as we pick this up. Perspective as an outsider, how does this look to you? Well, I know very little about this particular story, but I would say that these problems are problems across the world. I mean, in Europe, we have a big problem with refugees moving out of Syria, moving out of those conflict zones, and they are problems that I think require global international solutions. I think what we're seeing everywhere, we've seen it in Britain as well, is that the the nation states alone have difficulties dealing with problems such as this. And so that, that you've seen the tension in, in Europe. Um, Britain voted to leave Europe partly on immigration issues. and on, on the, so, so I think that, that the, the solutions are... I, I think, I mean, you could broaden the... the i be more philosophical about it. I, I wonder, we're going to talk about other... We'll probably talk about climate, I suspect, later. Th these are pro global problems require global solutions. And I don't think, actually, that our institutions and, and based on nation states are capable of dealing with these 21st century problems. And you see it with refugee problems. Did you hear that? It was a very interesting insight where Brian Cox is saying that the problems that are facing the world, whether it's in Australia or in Europe, they are problems that supersede the ability of the nation state to deal with them. They're global problems and they require global solutions and that the nation states are incapable of addressing these issues. The refugee crisis typifies it, doesn't it, where one nation just says, it's not my problem, it's someone else's problems. And we shuffle these people from nation to nation to nation and nobody really wants to put up their hand and say, at my expense and my cost. And I think that what you'll find is that when some of the cleverest minds in the world today, the spokesmen that are speaking for the thinking intellectual audience are beginning to say that we need to start thinking in paradigms that exceed the idea of the jurisdiction of nation states, where we need to be advocating and pushing for, for more pan-national solutions and more global solutions. That as a Seventh-day Adventist who has always been keeping his ear open to the idea that Revelation's view of, of a global superpower that has some influence in the economy and in the um, livelihoods of, of global citizens. As you begin to hear this language, the hair on my neck stands up and I think, you know what? We actually do have something to contribute to the discussion. Penny Wong, who is a very um, bright and, and um, powerful communicator in, in the Australian political landscape has said the same thing as recently as a month ago. Global problems um, require global solutions. The refugee crisis, the environmental crisis, the economic crisis, they are relentlessly pushing our world towards a context in which the prophecies of Revelation are becoming more and more relevant. 
And we are here today in church because I think core to all of our worldview is that nation states may be incapable of solving the problems, but in essence, global government would be incapable as well. Would you agree? Some of the problems that we are facing with the rapid divide between the advantaged and the disadvantaged, the rapid separation between those in positions of power and privilege and those who are in positions of, of abject poverty and great need, to sort these problems out is going to require more than human will. We are here because we believe that God has the answer. And in the book of John, Jesus, in conversation with the, with the people of his day, said, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. Do you think that there is a danger that those of us who are so familiar with this promise can take it for granted? Let's for a moment savour the proposition. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying that in the world which is in a mess, those who put their confidence not in what man can do or in human solutions, but those who put their confidence in the divine Son of God, they have eternal life. That's an amazing proposition, isn't it? We have been, in essence, granted a promise, a guarantee, that whatever adverse circumstances affect us in this world, if we place our trust in Jesus, we can have eternal life. Jesus wants to recruit all of us into his kingdom so that we can live forever. And you would think such a statement by Jesus would have been welcomed by the audience. But it's rather amazing that when Jesus said that, many of his disciples said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? And Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said, does this cause you to stumble? The message puts it this way. This is a tough teaching, too tough to swallow. Jesus sensed that his disciples were having a hard time with this and said, does this throw you completely? The phrase, does this throw you completely, in the revised version, I think it's, does this cause you offence? Um, some versions will talk about stumbling blocks, others will talk about falling away. But all of the translations come from the Greek word scandalon, from which we get the English word scandal. Why would Jesus' statement to the Jews that if they believed in him, they would have eternal life, be understood as a scandal? The Greek word scandalon essentially um, comes from the concept of stumbling block or offence. And I don't know whether that picture is clear enough to you, but how many of you have ever done a face plant? It's a kind of bit embarrassing, Hannah, isn't it, when you do a face... Sorry, um, Edwina, when you do a face plant? Yeah, you can kind of go, oh, great shame. A face plant usually happens when we meet some obstacle that interrupts our planned pathway and our planned trajectory. It is something that comes along and gets in our road and causes us to go in a direction that we otherwise would not have intended to go. Consistently in the Bible, the word scandalon is used in a context where somebody's trajectory will be radically altered. It will take the upright and it will put them on their face and in other cases it will take somebody who is on their face and it will lift them upright. When Jesus was resolute in his journey towards Jerusalem and he explained to his disciples the consequences of his choice to go to Jerusalem, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him and saying, Lord, far be it from you to suffer such things. And the Bible tells us that Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a scandal on. You are an offence to me. For you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but on man's. If you review all the times the word scandalon is used in the Bible, you would find it hard to accept the idea that some people are saved and cannot be lost, and others are lost who cannot be saved. The word scandalon seems to indicate that in, within human experience is the ability for us to change direction. For us to be headed in one direction only to find ourselves confronted by some obstacle which interrupts our direction. 
scandal inevitably affects the people who are involved in it. Even today, the word retains some of its original meaning. The businessman whose business prospects are forever altered when he is found to be corrupt. The priest whose religious career is radically affected when it is revealed that he has been an abuser. The husband whose marriage relationship is forever altered when he is found to be unfaithful. These scandals inevitably affect the lives of those tangled up by them. But there is also the scandal of the North Korean who defects to South Korea, who rejects the theory of communism and embraces the freedom of the West. There is also the, the stories of the Ku Klux Klan um, person who has a connection with somebody that he thought could contribute nothing to his life and then radically alters his racist position to become a defender of multiculturalism. There is the narcissist who becomes philanthropic and can we dare say it, there is the sinner who becomes a saint. Scandal. Somebody's direction and trajectory is forever altered when they come into contact with something that alters their route. So I ask again, why would such a generically nice statement by Jesus have been seen by many of his disciples as so scandalous that from that time many turned around and walked no more with him. Let's have a, have a look for a few minutes at the context of Jesus' statement. Jesus claims to be the bread of life. History and tradition meant everything to the Jews. Their identity, their very essence was tied up in the stories of their past. You know, I've spent um, the last 21 years of my life with the Aboriginal community, and it's really interesting to recognise that different cultures relate to narrative in different ways. Aboriginals as a culture are very, very much bound by the stories of their past. The, the, the idea of narrative has so much power in cultures in which oral tradition is by far and above the strongest way of disseminating from one generation to another, the principles and, and, and propositions that determine who we are. And the Jews were very much like indigenous Australians. They were a society that is driven by narrative, recounting stories of the past, of how God has worked with his covenant people. It defined for the Jews who they were. They are so protective of their land. They are so protective of their, of their sanctuary, of their temple. They are protective of their culture. And even today, after all the world has thrown against the Jews as a nation, their resiliency to protect the narrative, the stories that define him, can only be admired even by those who perhaps don't necessarily think that they have um, been custodians of the stories given to them in a good sense. For the Jews, their narrative stories reinforce to them the exclusivity of God's favour for them as a nation. For them, the fact that God had given manna to the generation that left Exodus, left in, in the Exodus left Egypt, the fact that God had given them manna said to that generation, you are my special people. I am doing for you what I am doing for nobody else. And so for a Jew, the idea that God gave them bread from heaven was held up before the surrounding nations saying, which one of you have also received bread from heaven? It was a way of them being a little bit one-upman on the nations around them. And when Jesus came down and said, I am the bread of life, he goes on to say that those who ate manna in the wilderness have died. But I am the bread that has come down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. Now this is a very provocative thing for Jesus to say. 
While manna was a great gift from heaven and did reveal God's love for the covenant people, Jesus rephrases the Jewish narrative to emphasize the truth that Moses and the Exodus generation did not fully benefit from the promise that God wanted to give them. They died. They did not enter the longed-for rest that they were promised. Jesus, by saying that he is the bread of life that came down from heaven, which if a man eats will never die, was setting himself up in a juxtaposed position to that of the Jewish narrative. However great Moses was, the manna he gave was incapable of giving eternal life. I have come down from heaven, commissioned by God, and I am giving you my body, which if you eat, you will live forever." By claiming to be greater than Moses and by claiming that his body was greater than manna, he is developing a scandal, a stumbling block, if you may, because the Jews were now compelled to choose between being protectors of their own narrative and accepting a new view that was offered to them by Jesus. The scandal was that their belief system had been centred in what had been and Jesus was inviting them to believe in what could be through him. I am the living bread, Jesus claimed, that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Jesus claims to be the new manna, the better manna, and manna that does not just sustain for a day. Jesus claims to be life for heaven that will save not only those within the Jewish family, but indeed is for the benefit of the whole world. This is a scandalous statement by Jesus because it requires them to accept a whole new paradigm. It requires them to detach from the past um, precious and protected paradigms and instead embrace what Jesus has to offer. The Jews tried to make sense of it all, and in John's record, he essentially gives the same speech again, but Jesus says it in an even more forceful manner. As the living Father has sent me, and I live because of the Father, so who eats me will also live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as your father's ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. Can you see what Jesus has done? The Jews, so protective of their own history and their own story, are now confronted by a messianic figure which claims to be better than Moses and to have bread that is better than manna. Jesus is asking the Jews to redirect their dependence from a tradition rich in symbolism and promise to the actual divine reality. Let me try and use a metaphor to help you understand. How many of you can remember when mobile phones looked like this? Who here has owned a Nokia? They were cool phones, weren't they? They would ring and you could pick them up and you could talk. It was a fantastic invention. They were cable free and their batteries would last three or four hours. They were an awesome thing to carry around. But I can remember going into Harvey Norman back in about 2004 saying, I want an organizer and I want a phone. They said, they're not invented yet, but they're coming. I said, oh, really? What's it called? Apple's bringing out an iPhone. Well, was I an early uptaker of the technology? Absolutely. iPhone, I'm buying it. It's mine. It's great. Smartphones, have they revolutionised the world? Who here would um, choose a Nokia over a mobile, uh, over an iPhone? Put your hand up. Okay. So, um, Cynthia, she she wants a Nokia. You just like the simplicity? Okay. Um, I'm glad that you are are a remnant and and a small group. You're probably Jesus' best friend. But I would have to say that the majority of us would happily swap our Nokia for an iPhone. Would you agree? And in fact, iPhone rode on that, that, that brand and that identity they had created, the innovators of the smartphone. And I remember having the iPhone 3, I remember the iPhone 4, I remember the iPhone 5, I remember the iPhone 6, and I'm salivating at the idea of an iPhone 7 until somebody pointed out that Samsung actually has a Galaxy Note 7 Edge or something, I don't know. Is that, is that right? And you can have a shower in it, you can go swimming with it, you can chuck it in the water, you can drive over it with a steamroller. I don't know, it'll weed your garden and feed your children and babysit your grandmother. It's awesome. And all of a sudden I'm thinking to myself, 
when I upgrade and give the new phone to my son, because that's what happens in my house, because I don't know how to use a slow-mo camera or need a 12 megapixel camera. So my son always steals my iPhone and gives me his old one, which is probably the way it works in all of your families that have kids as well. I asked Jared, so what, am I, what are we getting, Jared? Are we getting the Galaxy or are we getting the iPhone? And he goes, oh, Dad, it's a bit of a tough one. The competition's catching up. He said, get the iPhone. I said, why? He said, because if I get the Samsung, even though it might be on paper a better phone, all of the apps that I've invested in won't work. It's Android. It runs on a different platform. And my iCloud account is going to be all out of sync and my calendar won't work. And it's going to be so disruptive to accept something better that I'm happy to stick with what I've got. He didn't use those words, but that's basically a loose paraphrase. When Jesus' disciples realised that Jesus was offering them a superior model, they also recognised that by buying into his promise, they must necessarily detach themselves from all that previously had been precious. They had placed their confidence in their own narrative and in their own story and in their own understanding. And Jesus now is coming along with propositions that compel them to think about the world through new eyes. And for many of them, it was just too difficult. This is tough teaching, Eugene Peterson paraphrases in the message. Too tough to swallow. And when Jesus sensed that his disciples were having a hard time accepting a new worldview and rejecting the old, he said to them, does this cause you to stumble? Does this throw you completely? Is this for you a scandal? And the sad thing about this story is that the Bible tells us that after this discussion a lot of the disciples left Jesus. They no longer wanted to be associated with him. The pulpit commentary is one of my favourite commentaries. It's available on the um, web program that I use to um, do my Bible study. And in reading the pulpit commentary on this passage in John 6, the, the theologian has this to say, Christ's teaching tested as well as attracted men. There was a repellent force as well as an infinite fascination. He sifted as well as saved. The very deeds and words that broke some hearts into penitence roused impatient and angry remonstrance in others. There is seen in this gospel a continual departure and a deepening faith. I'm sure that's what he meant to say. Um, the spell error is um, in the text. It's not, it's not mine. Would you agree? Does the gospel confront the simple statement that whoever believes in me will not perish but have everlasting life? Is this just a general nice statement that everybody is willing to affirm? No, according to the record of, of those who were there while Jesus were teaching it, they describe Jesus' ministry as being like a rock of offence. For some people, they would fall on it and be broken. For others, it would fall on them and crush them. The gospel truly underst understood is always a scandal. It will always create division. It will always create a polarising into two camps. You know, Adventists have always had some sense that before the end of this world's history, there will be among us a sifting and a shaking. Are there any old timers here who have heard of that concept? The sifting and the shaking? We don't talk about it very much um, today, but I think that the idea has great merit. It is consistent with truth as it has been revealed throughout all ages. Truth will win disciples, but it will also alienate those who are unwilling to buy into its paradigm. Scandalous truth will always bring us to a point of decision. And how sad that the teaching of Jesus will repel as well as compel. 
that there will be some who will say, this is a hard saying, we cannot bear it. And from that time, turn around and walk no more with Jesus. Paul, in his letter to the church at Rome, longs for the Jewish nation to place, place their faith fully in Christ. Unwilling to believe in Jesus, the Jews continue to persist in the pursuit of their own righteousness, a righteousness apart from God. Listen what Paul has to say. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for the Jews is for their salvation. For I testify that they have a zeal and a passion for God. But they've not done it intelligently. Instead, not being willing to understand the free gift of God's righteousness through Jesus. They are intent on pursuing and establishing a righteousness of their own making. They have been unwilling to surrender themselves to the righteousness of God. As he described the preaching of the cross to the church in Corinth, Paul said, the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. We preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block. It's a scandal to them. And to the Gentiles, foolishness. Jesus in John 6 proposes that he wants to give his life for the world. Why is his message so scandalous? Because it compels us to consider. Are we going to accept that our salvation lies entirely in the death and resurrection and saving grace of God? Or are we in our own ignorance going to pursue a redemption that is based on our own efforts and our own passion? for self-righteousness. As I look in the mirror, I am convinced that I am like all men and women. We are flawed by a indulgence in the idea that our own ability to accurately describe reality is valid. To accept the suggestion that there lies within the human nature an ability to call darkness light and light darkness. It's not one that we are ready to accept. We defend our opinions and our points of view with rigour and enthusiasm. We hope that others will benefit from our wisdom and advantage themselves of our superior intellects. But saints, I know from my own experience that too often we find that confidence in our own ability to save ourselves shows up to be a fatal confidence. Would you agree? We are incapable of saving ourselves. And when Jesus comes along and says, if you will put your confidence in me, you have eternal life, there are some who are so invested in their own efforts to save themselves, that they see the proposition as scandalous. Belief and confidence in God demands that we detach ourselves from all that we have invested in. Our confidence needs to be placed not in what we can do for ourselves, but in what he has done, is doing, and will do. Faith and belief in Christ require us to derive our sustenance and power from outside of ourselves. We cannot eat anybody else's food. We must consume the bread from heaven if we would have eternal life. Believing in Christ is mutually exclusive to trusting in ourselves. Paul, in his letter to the church in Galatia, says, I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who is living in me. And the life which you now see me living in the flesh, I live by complete dependence on the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. You know, the nature of true faith, Hebrews 11.6 tells us that faith is, is nothing short of just accepting that God is who he says he is and that he will reward those who diligently seek him. 
You know, when I was reading this text at two o'clock this morning, it hit me with the full force of somebody who is awake when they shouldn't be. That how does God reward us? Many times we want to define those rewards in God getting on board with our agenda. That God will bless my job, that God will bless my family, that God will bless my garden, that God will bless my car, God will bless my reputation, my career pathway, my relationships, whatever it might be. But in this text, who is God? God is a God who loved me. And what is the reward for those that diligently seek him? He gave himself up for me. Could there be any other reward that compares or competes? We may for a while want God's power in our lives so that we can be blessed in our own agendas and goals. But when we recognise that what God is asking for is an exclusive relationship where we are prepared to die to our own hopes and dreams and instead reclaim his hopes and dreams, instead of seeing that as a positive, freeing, freeing experience, many see it that the price is too expensive and unwilling to die to self, they turn around and they leave. And as the flood of disciples were being sifted from Jesus' entourage, he turns to his own 12 disciples and he says to them, do you also want to leave? And I hope that the words of Peter resonate with you as they do with me. Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words of real life. Of eternal life. Not all will leave. Those who value heaven's gift and satiate themselves on heaven's fare will not want to leave. The scandal that drives many away will bring us closer. Where on the philosophical landscape can we go? Hedonists find happiness elusive. The naturalists live in a heartless universe devoid of meaning and purpose. The capitalists find too often that you can gain the whole world and lose your own soul. Jesus today is still inviting you to trust in him. He is still offering you life. His scandalous proposition still remains valid. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you will put your confidence in Jesus, you will have eternal life. Lord, it's a scandalous proposition that you convict and convince us that we are sinners. But Lord, you do it only for one reason, that we may lose confidence in ourselves as we are overwhelmed in our confidence in you. Lord, may none here this afternoon see themselves as unworthy or unable to come to you for that life you so freely offer. May none of us be terrified to trust. Lord, you have shown throughout history that you can rescue, that you can redeem, that you can restore, and that you can prepare us for a life that will never end that we might appreciate it, that we might believe it, that that truth might change and transform us into the people that you want us to be. Lord, grant us the abundant life that you have on offer. May we boldly grab hold of it and not turn away from it is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.